Hello everyone, it's friend of the channel Jeff and I am high in the Sierra Mountains today right above a place called Donner Lake. And I would like to tell you a story about something that happened there many years ago that I think you will find interesting. The story I want to tell you today is about this man, George Donner and his wife who left Independence, Missouri, the 12th of May, 1846, and were headed for the fertile valleys of Central California. In the spring of 1846, 500 wagons headed west from Independence, but George Donner got a late start. They actually left on May 12th. They should have left much earlier, no later than April 15th. It was kind of a guessing game you had to go through. You couldn't leave too early because then you would find yourself in the Midwest trying to cross spring runoff swollen rivers. If you waited too late, that caused a myriad of problems. You had grass fires across the plains to contend with, water holes that have gone dry, it really was a guessing game as to when the best time to leave was. The other important family that was part of the group leaving Independence that day was James and Margaret Reed. Within a week of leaving Independence, they met a group led by William H. Russell of 50 additional wagons. Up to that point, everyone went to Fort Hall, and then they decided whether they wanted to continue on the Oregon Trail or they wanted to turn slightly south to go to California. An unscrupulous promoter who had left earlier in the year named Lansford Hastings sent writers back to tell them that he had a better way to California now. It was a way that had much less mountains and he promised water the entire way. Also during that time was the war with Mexico and he told them that the Mexican authorities would be meeting them at the border in California to stop them from heading west. He promised them that by taking a new way that the Mexican authorities would not be waiting where they would cross into California. But the only problem with all of this was he himself had never gone the entire route. As a matter of fact, he was telling them to go away that up until that point no one had gone before. On July 20th, on the banks of the Little Sandy River, most of the wagon train opted to follow the established trail via Fort Hall. Another group, led by James Reed, decided to take the Hastings Cutoff. This was the first of many mistakes that the Donner Party made. As the party turned south to follow the Hastings Cutoff, Within days, they found the terrain much more difficult than described. Drivers were forced to lock the wheels of their wagons to prevent them from rolling down steep inclines. Several years of traffic on the main Oregon Trail left an easy and obvious path, whereas the new cutoff was more difficult to find. Hastings wrote directions and left letters stuck to trees. All of this cost them a month that they didn't have. And finally, they found themselves right in the middle of the salt flats with no water, which took seven days to cross. During this time, one member of their party, Luke Halloran, died of tuberculosis. Now the oxen that they used to pull the wagons and their cattle that they brought with them began dying. Now they were in the middle of the salt flats. And thus far they had lost over 100 oxen and cattle and their rations were completely depleted. On one night, 
the Paiute Indians stole 18 cattle and the following night they returned to shoot 21 more. They had little time to rest. The company pressed on to cross the Sierra Nevada before the snows came. They had been told they had until mid-November to cross the Sierra Nevada mountains before they really had to worry, and this wasn't true. They could see the mountains around October 20th, and they pushed hard to get to them as quickly as they could. But they were too late. They got snowed in. It was impossible for them to go any further west. They found a small cabin near Donner Lake and decided that it was there they would make their winter stand. This is a picture of what their winter camp looked like drawn by one of the survivors. They made several attempts in small groups to make it over the mountains on on end to California, but each time they returned defeated. Then a storm came lasting over a week and all of the remaining cattle died. Delirium set in because of hunger and Patrick Dolan stripped off his clothes and ran into the woods. He returned shortly afterwards and died a few hours later. It was at this time that one of them had the idea to eat Dolan, which they promptly did. By now, the people in California had heard that one of the parties did not make it all the way over into the mountains and they decided to go looking for them. Residents in California donated $1,300 for a search and rescue party and on February 4th, seven members of a rescue party found them at Donner Lake. What they found was horrific. There was 44 people left alive and bodies were stacked like cordwood for them to eat later. 21 people elected to try and return with the rescue party. All of them made it but one. John Denton died along the way. The second rescue party arrived March 1st. It was a better prepared rescue party and included veteran mountain men and John Turner, one of the people who left with the first rescue party. Only five people remained at Donner Lake because they were too ill to travel. Soldiers returned in June of 1847 and buried the remaining bodies that were laying around and burned all remnants of the Donner Party's cabins. Lansford Hastings, the gentleman who talked the Donner Party into taking his marvelous cutoff, was vilified and spent the remainder of his life as an outcast. After the American Civil War, He and several Confederate sympathizers decided they would go to Brazil and try and form a colony there. He died in Brazil, unwanted by his own country. One of the survivors was Mary Murphy, a 13-year-old whose parents died during the ordeal. After surviving by resorting to cannibalism, She was unloved and unwanted by everyone on the planet and ended up marrying a man who basically beat her to death. One man, Louis Kiesberg, refused to be rescued and stayed at the original camp until April and walked out on his own. He knew that the rest of the world would not accept what they had done and that he was a marked man. As he grew older, he did not venture outside. He became a pariah and was often threatened. He once told someone, 
I think that the Almighty has singled me out among all men on the face of the earth in order to see how much hardship, suffering, and misery a human being can bear. There is a monument on the shores of Lake Donner where all of this transpired. Not very many of the survivors went on to lead productive lives. One became the sheriff in Sonoma County. One bought five acres of land and planted an orchard. Several of them became uh, circus performers. They were freaks. Um, there was several suicides. Um, it was a pretty abysmal ending to most of their lives. The last survivor died in 1935. I hope you found that story interesting. I can tell you, even after all these years, this is an extremely spooky place to be. When I was in my early 20s, I broke down in this very spot once and had to sit here all night long until sunrise the following morning when I dug out my tools and repaired my car. I can tell you it was a night I'll never forget sitting up here. Well, remember folks, be good to each other, do good deeds, think good thoughts, and I will see you again. Bye.